What's happening on the markets? Um, the Dow right now is up about 400 points. S&Ps are up about 40 points. Last week, a skeleton crew from Backlight met in the team's deserted office. The reason? To explore the impact of the coronavirus on the world's financial markets. Via video calls with a colourful group of investors, traders and financial analysts, we take the temperature of these unprecedented and turbulent times. They're people who have a lot to lose, but who can often afford it as well. First, we take stock with Scott Bauer, a veteran of the Chicago Stock Exchange. He spent years screaming in the trade pits. Now, he's an analyst for US financial networks like Bloomberg and CNBC. Scott is at home now and has had a couple of very intense weeks. Hey, Scott. Hi, great. Uh, how does the whole corona crisis affect your daily life? Well, from a personal perspective, myself and the other seven people in my family and my five dogs are all quarantined at home right now. And, and could you describe a little bit how you have experienced these last weeks on the market? So I have been a professional trader since 1991. I've traded through every event you could think of. And I've traded and lived through the volatility and handled the volatility. This is unprecedented. This this blows all of those experiences out of the water. So as, as we've been speaking, the Dow was up 400, it's now negative. <laughs> That's the kind of volatility that we're, we're going through right now. I'm looking right here, it just, just turned negative. So what does it do to you? I mean, your your health, your uh, how's your heart doing? I'm fine. I'm fine. Now, I'd be lying to you if I'd said that, you know, sure, there wasn't a little bit more angst right now. There is. Are you getting up earlier than you used to? Oh, I, I don't even set an alarm. I just, you know, I'm, I'm probably up four or five times of the night just checking, you know, what are the markets doing now? And I'll go right back to sleep. And then I'll wake up an hour later and what are the markets doing and, you know, so on and so forth. Yeah, my wife doesn't like it so much, <laughs> but, um, you know, it, it, it is what it is. That's that's part of what I do. Hello, Joachim. Oh, can you see me? Yes, you yes. can. It looks like you're in your office. Yes, we're the only ones Why in the office. Are you in your office? Yeah. <laughs> Aren't you supposed to stay home? <laughs> Joachim Clement is a German who has lived in London for years. He's an independent analyst for a major stockbroker. We call him in the hope of reassuring words. He thinks investors should mainly think long term. With enough patience, things usually work out. So what type of work do you do? I uh, cover financial markets. And uh, as probably even the most uninterested person has noticed, it's been quite a week. Uh, I've been in the markets for more than 20 years now. And uh, we all joked that in 2008, 2009, we would never see something like that again. But over the last week, we've seen something that was possibly even worse than that. Mm -hmm. What people are reading your reports or your analysis? Uh, these are all professional investors, so pension funds, insurance companies, as well as professional asset managers. Mm -hmm. So what kind of questions do you get in your position? Interestingly enough, in the beginning, the questions were mostly about how bad is it going to be. Uh, over the last couple of days, the questions started to shift towards, we've seen such a big decline in markets that a lot of investments look extremely cheap. So should I buy now? Where should I buy now? Where are the opportunities if we assume we can hold on to that investment until the crisis is over? Mm -hmm. So do you think we're at the bottom of the market already? 
I have given up predicting that. And uh, my perfectly honest answer is nobody knows. Hoping for a treatment or a vaccine. Mm-hmm. That, that is basically the, the end game. Until we have a vaccine or an effective treatment, it seems unlikely at the moment that we will keep, get this under control. And, and, and what do you advise your clients? If you haven't sold any of your investments yet, it's too late to sell now. Yes, the situation might go on for quite a while longer. Yes, it might get worse, but you've already suffered severe losses. And if you sell now, you lock them in. In this case, my advice is stay the course and don't look at your portfolio. Because the the worst thing you can do in this environment is look at your investments because then you see how much money you've lost. You get scared on top of the scare that we all have from the virus and the pandemic and you're tempted to click on the sell button or do something with it and buy something else. All the evidence that we have as well as personal experience, uh, unfortunately, points to the fact that this is about the worst you can do. So what is the feedback you, you get from uh, like pension funds? Everybody was just going for basically the safest investments that they can have, which in this case was cash. Which kind of cash? US dollar. Even, even Europeans and British uh, people were going into the US dollar uh, because they didn't trust their local central banks. Uh, and that's scary in and of itself. Uh, This is a situation where governments and central banks have to essentially prepare the entire economy for a warlike decline in economic activity. I talk about the Chinese virus, and uh, and I mean it. That's what it came from. You know, if you look at Ebola, if you look at all the Lyme, right, Lyme, Connecticut, you look at all these different horrible diseases, they seem to come with the name, with the location. And this was uh, the Chinese virus. (laughs) Um, The biggest problem for the US government at the moment is that it doesn't speak with one voice. Financial markets and businesses have, to paraphrase Franklin Delano Roosevelt, only one thing to fear at the moment, namely fear the fear and the uncertainty of what is about to happen over the next six months or so. So, um, but what will will you do if there's a a total lockdown? Because are people who work in a trading room or a dealing room, are they essential? At the moment, the 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 British government, they've already indicated that the the people that keep the financial services running uh, will be considered essential. Uh, So that does not mean somebody like me who is a research analyst, um, but the traders who literally make sure that the the stock exchange can operate, they will definitely be uh, essential. So they will be like healthcare workers? Uh, Yes. uh, I would would say the the healthcare workers are are heroes, the traders are not. (laughs) Uh, In a sense, this situation right now is a little bit worse than a war because in a war you usually shut down the economy to produce other things that you need for the war effort. Now we're shutting down the economy to do nothing. For years, Bart Leinzer worked as a high-frequency trader. He made his money on the financial markets in milliseconds. We talked to him from his home in Singapore. Bart, kun jij beschrijven in wat voor soort situatie uh, jij bent? Het is hier redelijk relaxed. De regering heeft het redelijk goed onder controle. Uh, de meeste nieuwe gevallen die er nu komen, die komen uit het buitenland. Dat zijn Singaporezen die terugkeren. Uh, en die worden meteen uh, opgevangen, dus die, die kunnen de bevolking verder niet besmetten. Dus uh, men is hier redelijk relaxed. Uh, het, het leven begint weer een beetje zo'n normale gangetje te gaan. En hoe zit het met testen? Uh, testen is nagenoeg gratis. Het kost je 10 dollar, dat is niks. Uh, als je het hebt, dan wordt de hele behandeling door de regering betaald. Uh, dus mensen die het niet zo breed hebben... Die, die schrikken niet terug om zich te melden... omdat ze dan een grote rekening krijgen. Want het wordt toch wel betaald. Elke dag krijg je een overzicht... Met alle gevallen die gevonden zijn, waar die mensen allemaal geweest zijn, waar ze wonen, waar ze werken. 
uh, wat ze gedaan hebben. Dat is allemaal openbaar. Dus je kan van, nou we hebben 300 gevallen nu. Van al die mensen is bekend van wie ze het gekregen hebben. Al, al die temperatuurmannetjes die overal staan om te meten... die voorkomen dus dat je het zogenaamde presentism krijgt. Dat, wat je in Nederland ook vaak hebt. Want mensen zijn ziek. Ah, het is maar een koudje. Het is maar een griepje. Ik ga gewoon naar kantoor. En waar ze dus iedereen aansteken. Dat, dat heb je hier dus niet. En dat voorkomt dus heel veel gevallen. Wauw. En um, waar weet je nog waar je was toen de beurs ging? Uh, toen de beurs ging, toen lag ik lekker te slapen. En, uh, er kwamen wat cijfers uit over nieuwe besmettingen ergens elders in de, in de westerse wereld. En toen poef, die ging die. En je zit hier natuurlijk een beetje twaalf uh, uur tijdsgeschuld ten opzichte van Amerika. Dus dan word je wakker en dan zie je opeens dat de beurs helemaal in elkaar gekacheld is. Ja. En hoe stond jij erin op dat moment? Uh, ik had alles uh, cash gemaakt. Of het meeste, nog niet alles, maar het meeste cash gemaakt. Uh, ja, ik, ik ben nu dus, nu het zover naar beneden is, dus begin ik aan de koopkant te gaan... Dus ik heb wat koninklijke olie gekocht, omdat dat gigantisch in elkaar gegaan is. Het staat nu op een koers van begin jaren negentig. En dan zal er op korte termijn misschien wel iets met het dividend gebeuren, maar waarschijnlijk niet. Maar uiteindelijk gaat die olieprijs en dus koninklijke olie ook wel weer omhoog. Wie heeft er gewonnen, zeg maar, in, 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 de, in deze tijd? Um, nou, er zullen zeker heel veel handelspartijen zijn die gewonnen hebben. Uh, de high frequency traders zullen heel veel geld verdiend hebben in deze tijd... Mm-hmm. Dus zou je kunnen zeggen dat voor high-frequency traders dit zeg maar, historisch goede tijden zijn? Dat is nog even afwachten. Uh, misschien hebben die ook wat verliezen geleden. Maar historisch gezien zouden ze nu heel veel geld moeten verdienen. Um, je zit nu in Singapore. Blijf je daar nog? Of uh, sta je te popelen om terug naar Nederland te komen? Of? Uh, nou ja, uh, ik kan niet weg. Alle vluchten zijn gecanceld. Dus ook al zal ik terug naar Nederland willen, dan kan dat niet. En voorlopig uh, vind ik dat ik hier wel goed zit, want het is hier, uh, het is hier veilig. I've always been a geek about finance and I've always been a geek about how the system works. So like the really boring nuts and bolts, the plumbing of the system. Exactly. Isabella Kaminska is a journalist for the Financial Times in London. In a previous episode of Backlight, we talked to her about the rise of Bitcoin. Now we ask how she sees the current crisis. Okay, thank you so much, Isabella. Could you describe your situation right now? Uh, the FT has stopped. Um, basically, they have a skeleton crew like yourselves operating out of the office. Um, going back a little bit in time, um, how did you see the situation coming uh, we're in right now? I tend to be a little bit more alarmist than most people. Um, so I was looking at the images out of China and being very worried about them. I was following a few Twitter handles that were covering things and showing videos that I found extraordinary. I was trying to sort of say, well, this scale of response is just not consistent with what the equity markets are doing, which they were simply ignoring everything. But the oil markets got hit quite quickly and there was immediately a discorrelation. So I found this very bizarre, but a lot of my contacts were like, well, you've got to discount a lot of the news out of China. A lot of it is fake news. There's lots of people who are sort of, who have an interest in sort of um, hyping things up. But do you have an idea why they reacted so slowly? What, what kind of mindset? It seems to me that China was too late dealing with the problem early. And so I suspect in an emergency situation, you could get support from sovereign wealth funds and other sort of state capital to keep quietly buying equities to delay the panic. Because the worst thing that could have happened is if we panicked financially too early. Because Why? Because if there's a financial panic of the scale that we've seen now, but say a month ago, as opposed to now, it wouldn't coincide with the peak of the crisis. So to top everything off, you would be dealing with a, with a you know, failing healthcare system when the peak arrives, but also you would be dealing with a financial crisis, which could 
possibly take out salaries, jobs, um, and add to the chaos. So I think there had to be a sort of structured shutdown of the economy. Now, maybe, maybe I am being too hopeful in our own governments. Maybe they were really just badly, badly prepared. But it seems to me that they had a real interest in delaying the financial uh, repercussions. If it was me, I would shut down the economy in such a way that America gets shut down le at, right at the end, with UK second to right at the end because of the importance of its financial sector. And that slowly prepares people for what's coming without inducing too much panic. And then, you know, this is just theory. I mean, I, I, I have no insider knowledge on this. What can we do, do you think? What, 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 what possibilities are there? I, I hate to be really bleak, but it doesn't look good. And I think what we have now is an unprecedented wartime situation. And we are going from a regime of, of private market capital capitalism to one of temporary nationalization, because there's no way we can get through this without heaps and heaps of government support. So I expect there will be helicopter money drops. I expect that there will be um, sort of, ra to some degree, there may be rationing. How could capitalism, within our capitalist system, how could we tackle that? And, and how does it differ from the way China can do this? So I think the great thing capitalism has going for it is it's capacity to innovate and think creatively, um, which is not apparent with more command economy type uh, authoritarian regimes. For example, I wrote a column last week saying cabin crew are an excellent source of labor. They are very well trained. They have first aid um, qualifications. They respond very well to, to sort of um, command structures. They could be diverted very easily. From now, I think in hindsight, we understand why China decided to build two new hospitals in 10 days. Like at the time we were watching it on the video camp thinking China is mad. There is gonna be a, an entirely new world we're gonna be coming out into. Um, in some ways it could be good for the world because it would really reduce income inequality. The question is at what cost? I don't think everyone has really realized the scale of the kind of command economy that we're about to engage in, because we're still in a world where asset values mean something, but I just don't think they do anymore. So following all these movements and markets becomes kind of irrelevant, because as we know in a command economy, market prices are irrelevant. Charles Liu is an investor with a $600 million portfolio. He's only mildly concerned about the effect of corona on China, but he feels rather differently when it comes to the US. Hi, Charles. You're back, I'm back. Oh, great. Um, it's just that I don't... Yes, there you are. Oh, wonderful. So what's happened to your portfolio? Uh, cash flow negative. <laughs> what is your strategy in these times? I, I, this is personal. I'm looking at healthcare including preventive health healthcare and biomed, also looking seriously at agriculture and food production. In what sense? When central banks print money like this, we're going to have inflation. You can print all the money you want. All that does is bail out the Fortune 500. It's a bailout. Yeah. It's yeah. not going to solve the virus problem. When you have inflation, social stability will come from sufficient food supply. So eventually the Chinese government and other major emerging market countries will have to focus on food supply. You don't need Louis Vuitton, but you need rice, right? So those are the type of things I'm looking at now. If you compare like um, mainland China or more broader Asia and the European and American markets, do you see differences? There are all kinds of differences. 23,000 people ran in the Los Angeles Marathon when the mayor said, don't do it. Nobody wearing a mask, of course, and breathing hard and spitting everywhere. 23,000 people. In Asia, this would never happen. 
In the U.S., you have 11 million undocumented workers who don't want to go to the doctor and be reported to the immigration service. And you have 30 million uninsured or underinsured people who will not go because until last week, it cost them 1,500 U.S. dollars to get a test. In China, this is for free, the test? 100% free, the testing and the treatment. Now, you can imagine, you know, my friends in the U.S. are really, really scared because they don't want to go get tested. They get tested, they lose their jobs. In terms of the economy, there's another major difference. U.S. is basically service industry-based, more than 70%. What is that service? Aside from financial services of Wall Street, you have basically the McDonald's, the, the Starbucks, and all these type of services are people who cannot afford to get sick. And when the economy is shut down, these are people who can't afford to live even. I think the situation in the U.S. is probably the thing that worries me the most because it's a country that uh, population of 300 million but registered guns 340 million. I think we have to look at this from two perspectives, okay? We look at independently the U.S. market, Dow Jones down to below 20,000, so basically down over 30%. Now. Why did it go up 30%? Why did it go up so much? Because of the tax break. And when you have a massive tax break, what happened to the corporations? They take this money, they don't invest it. They do share buyback. S&P calculated that the total amount of share buyback is $1.5 trillion. What happens? Share prices go up, the CEOs get their big bonuses, they're happy, right? Now, that $1.5 trillion just disappeared, just evaporated into thin air. The Chinese side are more pragmatic. They look at the companies as whether or not they're real companies. Okay, there are some problems with Chinese companies because, you know, not all the numbers are necessarily completely truthful, but at least it didn't have this sugar high. And increasingly, this is what happened with JP Morgan Chase last week, they're saying, well, the Chinese market is a safe haven because the market size is here, the demand is here, the new middle class is here, right? The last person we talk to is a very old acquaintance, investor Mark Faber. For years, his gloom, boom and doom report has been a stubborn source of investment advice. His reports are sent by snail mail only to a few institutional investors, entrepreneurs and very wealthy individuals. And this is not the first time that he's warned of impending doom. What do we do now? I got to do something now. I Go. own gold. I own some real estate. Well, Look well, around well, you. Well, I think the next 10 years, I would be long essentially resource-based economies. I would even invest in Argentina today and Brazil because these are the price level is so low. Ah. Did your life change these last weeks, these turbulent weeks on the market? Well, you know, I manage money and I have investments. And obviously my investments have all gone down in value. <laughs> this is a major event in the sense that uh, I've been through many different crashes. But I have never seen a decline with the same intensity and in all assets. This time around, everything has been hit. Yeah. 
So uh, this is uh, has it changed my lifestyle now because I live a normal style, and I have everything here, and I have staff. They buy stuff for me, uh, mostly the supply of cigarettes. <laughs> so I'm in good shape. But I can tell you, a lot of people have been wiped out. Finish. Mm -hmm. This is a valley that goes down and down and may stay down, and you may not reach in your lifetime the other side of the valley, who knows? So the coronavirus is a trigger, it's a catalyst, but it is not the cause. The cause of the crisis is the instability that governments, through their agencies and through fiscal deficits, through regulation and through central banks have built. Mm -hmm. In the 70s, stocks and bonds were very low compared to the global economy. So if there was a financial problem, it wasn't helpful for the global economy, but it wasn't a disaster. Mm -hmm. But now, if the stock market goes down, it is a disaster for many people because they own shares themselves in their retirement accounts. Do you expect governments to nationalize uh, companies? I wouldn't be surprised if the ECB would say we're going to nationalize European banks. If this happens, it will be a, a very bad development for the capitalistic system and for the free market economy. So do you think that we're going to sort of the end of capitalism? It's possible. End of democracies. <laughs> that is quite likely that, uh, you know, we're coming to a reset in the world. And we in the West have always condemned, like the Chinese, that they don't have a democracy and so forth. But if I look, at how they and Singapore and also Hong Kong have addressed the coronavirus, I have to say they've done actually quite a good job. Mm -hmm. and, and what do you think on the longer term this will mean for uh, the markets in China? Will there be a different future than for Europe and the United States? I think the whole world will reset and for a period of time, like during the Depression, there will be very little growth. And I think standards of living will go down for a while. And so, you know, depending on which government, it may mean that you have a very different lifestyle than I had when I grew up, yeah. that you will be controlled at every stage of your life. Wow. Big Brother, do you understand? George Orwell, the Big Brother <laughs> in 1984. The government will check how much you drink and where you drink and we, whoever you are. So here are the communist leaders. <laughs> On the left you have Stalin and then Lenin, uh, Marx, Engels and at the top Mao. But why, Mark? Why? It's a collection. I thought, if I invest $20,000 in this collection, maybe one day it will be worth, you know, five million or so. So, you see all these badges. And each one has a different value. It's like a stamp. Yeah. So I have 330,000. But what will you do with this 330,000 badges? A thousand. <laughs> I'll eat them. <laughs> no. I, I mean, what do you, what do, you do? <laughs> the question is, what do you do with any of your possessions in life? This is the beauty about life, you can't take it along. Thank you for watching. For more on this subject, take a look at the playlist. You can also watch this recommended video. Don't forget to subscribe to our channel and we'll keep you updated on our documentaries.